And today, right, um, we're going to talk about prayer. And I want to speak about the first person is Nehemiah. Nehemiah, you know, although he had the he had this time to leave, you know, from exile back home. He didn't. He stayed in the court, in the king's court. And, you know, but he always wanted to hear what happened back home. And his brother Han- Hananiah came and he asked him, hey, what is happening at home? What's going on? And, you know, what happened to the people that left? How are they doing? And his brother told him, listen. They're not doing well. They're doing terribly, you know. And the walls of Jerusalem, they are broken. And the gates are all burned up. And he felt so sad, you know. He was moved by this news. And that's how we get. When we get some sad news, we get, we get sad, you know. And so... I want you to open your book in Nehemiah, and we're going to take it from there. And today, you know, I titled this Prayer, a petition to God, you know, and prayer hasn't changed. You don't have to text God, you know, you don't have to send them a, a letter. Prayer remained the same, you know. The communication between you and God is simply a moment by yourself with him and you speak out loud or you speak softly or quietly in the, those quiet moments and you lift up your petition to the Lord and he will hear your petition. Point one, if you remain in me, my words will remain in you. If you abide in me, my words will abide in you. All right, this is Nehemiah chapter 1, 4, verse 4 through 11. Nehemiah's prayer. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I say, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his commandment of love with those who love him and keep his commandment. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. It's praying before you day and night for your servant, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. You know, let's pause there for a moment. In this prayer, you know, he included himself, you know. Sometimes we pray for somebody else's sin, or sometimes we pray for one of our family members' sin, but we should include ourselves. The book in Nehemiah also is combined with the book of Ezra, and Ezra, Ezra does the same thing. We have sinned against you, Lord. And Ezra just came in to help and build the temple, but he put himself in the same position. So as Nehemiah. Let's take that from him. And then verse 7, it says, We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed your commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. Verse 9. But if you return to me and obey my command, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, horizon. I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Verse 10, they are your servants and your people who you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and the prayer of the servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant's success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearing, cupbearer to the king. Praise God. Look at this prayer. Take note of this prayer. He put himself in there. He's asking God. He re- asking for favor, but he's also recalling what God has promised. 
God has promised all of us his word, his promise. But he's calling, you could do the same thing in this prayer. Now, you know, here is Nehemiah serving the king, serving in the court. And then the, the, the king looked at him and says, you look sad, but you don't look ill. Because he's never been sad in front of the king. But the king noticed that. And this can be nothing but sadness of the heart, he said. And then he said, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruin and the gates have been destroyed by fire? That's what was in his heart. And he told him, and remember, he said to the Lord, give me favor in front of this man. So here it is. Let's take Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4. Then the king said to me, what is it you want? Wow. He has God's favor. Sometimes you may put in a situation and all of a sudden you see the door opening. Wow. Say, oh my God, that's you, God, because I couldn't have done this. You know, <laughs> praise the Lord. Then I prayed to the God of heaven. In that moment, you could pray. I remember the situation um, I remember going back home one time and trying to get my father to come with me and his papers were not right for some reason or another. And they said, well, you know, he was the, the lady at the airport says, I'm sorry, sir, but you can't, you can't leave today. You would have to go back tomorrow um, to get your papers straight. Uh, and I'm saying to myself, I'm listening to this. I said, no, the plane is here. We're leaving today. All of a sudden I started presenting to the Lord, this person. Right there and there, I started presenting, just praying in my mind, looking at her and praying in my mind. And you know, all of a sudden she made a phone call, whatever it was, and she allowed my dad to, to go with me to back to the United States. And it was like that. He started praying at that moment to the God of heaven. And he says, if it pleases the king and if, your servant has found favor in his sight. Let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so I can rebuild it. Put it right in front of him. Okay, this is what I want to do. You know? Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 7, it said, And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my the Lord, everything says it. But not only that, you see, when God opens the door, He opens the door, you know? Not only granted that, but He granted letters for the governors as, as Nehemiah was going to travel back to Judah. He opened uh, letters so He can get the timber that He needed to build the walls and the gate. He opened letters, you know, he granted that an army, cavalry, would escort him back home. Look at this, you know. He has a whole entourage going with him back there. That's our God. That's the God you serve. He's not just going to open the door and let everything, you know, you got to work yourself through. No, he's going to provide that for you so you can get to the point you need to be. Praise God. And here he is. Here's Nehemiah going back. Uh, remember, Nehemiah served the court. He didn't return back with the exile. He remained back in Babylonia. He didn't return back. He, was, he stood there while everybody left. But while he was serving in the court, he learned all this. He learned how to be political correct, how to negotiate. He was watching all this as the king did this. As a cup bearer, he was exposed to all this. You know, he was, a, but he didn't know that God was equipping him for this day. You know, perhaps you're in a workplace right now, and perhaps you're doing things, you're learning things, and sometimes you even question yourself. Why am I learning this? You know, probably you're in school, or you're probably at work. Say, why is this? Why is this? It might be a purpose for you. 
get ready. It might be that you have to learn this skill because down the line, the, the Lord's going to open the door for you and get you there. Remember, Nehemiah was not a priest. Although he was put in this position because of his character, his faith, God favored and put him there to equip them. God has favored all of us and put us in a situation in your career, in your work, so you could learn some skills that he's going to use for his kingdom, for his glory. Hey, Amen. And sometimes you get opposition. Sure, Nehemiah got opposition, but you see, he was ready for this. He, would, he knew how to negotiate because, you know, the king also had opposition. And he know how to deal with that. And he learned from watching. Praise God. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a program that we have here in the United States, um, probably throughout the country, that is uh, bring your daughter, bring your son to work, right? And what a great exposure for a child to see your career, to see what they're doing. And it probably, the experience in that office or in that workplace, it might not be what you do but it might be what something else is doing. Or maybe somebody, and then she, that person will capture that, will be inspired by that. And then all, of a sudden, all of a sudden, they got a dream in their minds. You know, when I grow up, I want to be that way. I want to see, I want to do that. So, you know, here's Nehemiah. He's running with it. He's going to do, he's going to rebuild. The wall is going to rebuild the gate. <laughs> and when he got there, he didn't tell the people what he was, his plan. He observed what was going around the city. And then he talked to the people. And he told them, Nehemiah 2, 17, he says, You see the trial we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruin, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be disgrace. He got the people together and they started building. Everybody with their talent started building it together. He was able to do that, you know. And one thing about this is that opposition came, but half of the people he put them together said, look, half of your people are going to be in the watch. The other ones are going to work. And they never stopped. That's how they reach their goals. And we can't let opposition stop us. We have a mighty God. Let's trust in the Lord for these things, these challenges. And keep going. Keep going back. Don't, you might be stopped for a moment, but bounce back. Bounce back and keep going. And they didn't stop and they reached their goal. John 15, 7 says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. Nehemiah was aligned with the Lord. He was aligned with the Lord. And when the time came for, to ask, he asked and the Lord provided and used Nehemiah to build the walls of Jerusalem, the gates. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's look at the second point. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Watch and pray so you will not fall in temptation. Hmm. You know, in Genesis 5, Genesis 6, I'm sorry, verse 5 to 8, it talks about Noah. You know, and the Lord saw how great and wickedness of the human race has become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Look at where Noah was living, where everything was wicked. All the people had wickedness in their heart. Us too, we are challenged in our workplace in our school, in our career, wherever we walk, even in these streets, even in this city, 
you know, the wickedness. And sometimes we got to just, you know, grab, hold on to our faith, grab on to God's word so we can just withstand whatever's in front of us and go over that. My, pa- um, my pastor uh, that uh, we, we have, uh, this is a young pastor, and this young pastor just got divorced, and he went to the service, and when they opened the door, there was no security guard there. And when the security guard was not there, he confronted a young woman, and the young woman said, Oh, Pastor, I'm glad you are here. Let me hug you. He said, he said, no. He just got divorced. He says, no, no. Hold on. You see, temptation is going to come like that. But we got to stand on firm ground with the Lord. And here is Noah. In the midst of all this craziness, what's going on? And... The Lord told Noah, says, that he regret, you know, that he had made the human beings on this earth. And he was troubled by all this, what was going on. Noah was 500 years old when this is happening. You see, when God's calling comes to you, doesn't matter how young you are or how young at heart you are, you know, it's okay. You got mail. <laughs> and Noah got mail that day. He said, God is telling him at 500 years old, and at 500 years old, that's when he had three children. Whoa. He had Shem, Ham, and Jephthah, three boys. Praise God. And now the Lord's calling him. On Genesis 6, 9 through 10, It talks about Noah and the flood. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. And he walked faithfully with God. Praise God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. He separated from everyone. Not separate to be distant, but separate for the Lord. His faith was in God. And at 500 years old, he gets commission. God continues to tell him, verse 11 says, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. So God said, 13 says, so God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. In verse 14, he tells them, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Here it is. Down to make an ark. He gives them the dimensions. He tells them that it's going to be three levels. He tells them that he has to prepare it so the animals could fit. So food could be stored. And it's for him and his family. Wow. And you know, on verse 22, he says, And Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Noah complied. You see, when you are aligned with God, when a calling comes, a commission comes, you comply. It just goes right through. You know, but when you're not aligned, you start questioning. Are you going to make a what? You're going to make an art bigger than this neighborhood? (laughs) There's no rain. How are you going to get into the sea? You know, but he's, but Noah complied. He started building. And that's when God's calling comes to you. He says, look, do this. And you're going to go just like Nehemiah. You're going to go and do it. Genesis 7, 1 through, 5, 1 through 5. And it says, build the ark. 
the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark and, and you and your family because I have found you righteous in this generation. The, uh, the ark is built. Now God brought the animals two by two. And now he's telling him, hey, go in, you and your family. Meanwhile, he has told everybody, look, save yourself, repent. This is going to happen. But no one listened because their heart was filled with wicked, wickedness. And the time came, and the time came when the doors were shut and no one left inside with his family. And this reminds me of Acts 16, 31, when the Lord, when the, uh, the jailman says, what can I do to Paul and Silas? What can I do to be saved? He said, it says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. Wow, it's like the same promise in the New Testament. You believe you're going to be saved and you and your household. Praise God. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Praise God. You know, um, in Williamstown, Kentucky, if you have an opportunity, they have a replica of Noah's Ark. And it's huge. It's massive. And it has the three levels. And it has the door. And there's a lot of things to see. It's amazing how this is put together. And it took, some, it took them about, with all the technology, it took them about almost three years to build. It says that it took about 75 to 100 years to build Noah, to build the ark that Noah built. And there's a prayer there that I want to share with you. And, it's, and when, he, when they were leaving, gather his family and Noah made a prayer. And it said like this, it said, God of heaven, we ask for your mercy through this terrible storm. You call me to build a ship that preserves my family and the animals that you brought to me. And I have sought to be faithful to honor you in all that I have done. Preserve us now through your judgment on this world as you have promised. And we will be faithful to serve you all of our days. Praise God. For me and my house will serve the Lord. Praise God. And they kept going. Now, in Genesis 8, 3, 5, it says, after the storm went on, and they're going, they're going, God remembered Noah and the wild animals and the livestock and the ark. And the water began to recede steadily from the earth. Verse 4, and on the seventh day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Arad. Wow. It rested on a mountain. Many people have tried to find this ark, but it says there, it rested in Arad. If they would have found out, it's in Turkey. And in Genesis 9, verse 14 through 16, God makes a covenant with Noah. And he says, with this sign of the rainbow, verse 14 says, whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the cloud, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all the living creatures of every kind. Never again will the water become a flood to destroy all life. Praise God. So every time you see that rainbow, that's God's covenant. Not until to all of us that he's not going to destroy the earth again with flood. Praise God. Today in Noah's Ark, they have found it in the Mount of Arata in Turkey. And it's a mountain where it's, uh, it's snow-capped. When, but when it's a good day, that 
You could probably see it. You could probably see it. They have measurement. Scientists have gone there. It's about the same dimensions as the Bible. And they have tested the wood and found out that it's about 4,000 years old at the same time that the flood happened. Praise God. Because when God does something, that's evidence of it. And you'll see it. Praise God. Matthew 26, 41 says, watch and pray. That's what Noah was doing. He was watching and praying. And it says that you enter not in temptation. Although his world was upside down, he kept his faith in God. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know? What God put in you, that spirit always want to praise God. Always wants to see God. But this body wants to hold it back. So you got to submit this body to his authority. It's challenging, but it's doable. Right. Noah did it. You know? And Nehemiah did it. Aligned it with God. And it could be done. Praise the Lord. It was a wicked world, and that's how we escaped this world, you know, submitting our thoughts to the Lord Jesus Christ's authority. Praise God. Point three, greater love. Praise God. As we commemorate our World War II heroes and fallen soldiers, you know, um, uh, I was watching the movie, uh, The Longest Day, you know, the war on Normandy. And it's just amazing how these soldiers went and fought for our freedom, for what we stand for, you know, from the wickedness of the Nazi power, you know. And they got together with the allies, with the, with the French people, with the uh uh, British people to overcome these, this enemy. And they gave their life for all of us. And John 15, 30 said, great love has no one than this, that they lay down his life for his friend. You know what? Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and I. He's the Lamb of God. We are all his friends. He died not only for us, but all our extended family abroad or they are here. Everyone that lives in this earth. There is no distance far for God. He's the Lamb of God. He died for all of our sins. John 10, 9 says, I am the door by me. If any man enter, he should be saved and should go in and go out and should find pastures. When the door was shut at the ark, that's when the judgment began. Don't let your door be shut without Christ. Jesus is the door. He's coming soon. It's time to repent and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. If you confess and declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Praise God. God loves every one of us. Not only he is our friend, but he wants to make you a child of God. Praise God. You see, we are living in a wicked world as well. Matthew 24, verse 37 to 39 says, As it was in the days of Noah, so will be at the coming of the Son of Man, of Jesus. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and 
took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man, at the coming of Jesus Christ. Because he's coming back. This is the time for us to repent. This is the time for us to come and accept Jesus Christ. Invoke his name and you shall be saved. Don't let that door shut. The door is open. He is the door. He is the way. He is the truth. No one goes to heaven except through Christ Jesus. Praise God. You can make that prayer today to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Prayer is to communicate with God. It hasn't changed. The way we do correspondence has changed all through the years, through messengers, by mail, by email, by WhatsApp. But prayer has not changed. It's still the same. You can talk directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just open your heart to him and confess your sin and repent from all that and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And you will be able to stand no matter what happens, no matter where you are, just like Nehemiah. Nehemiah was not home. He was in exile, but he was dead. He was blessed and he was highly favored. Noah was living in a wicked situation, in a wicked world, just like we are living today. But he stayed faithful and he was blessed and he was commissioned by God. Praise the Lord. And you know, he died for our sin. He died for all of us, Jesus Christ, so our sin could be paid. Hallelujah. Praise God. Isn't God good? Isn't God wonderful? Praise the Lord. Our hope is in him. And today, make your hope in him, in Jesus Christ. Praise to God. Praise God. And when you see that rainbow, you know it's true. He's there for you. Praise God. We're going to ask Pastor Janice to come up. Praise the Lord. So be strong and courageous, for the Lord will be with you wherever you go.